Thanks again. So um, this is definitely a topic near and dear to my heart. This is my first home is congenital heart disease clinic. And the genetics of this are um, certainly evolving like most things in our understanding. And it's really important to patients. I'll say that you know most families ask me, is this genetic? And the answer is yes, but, and because, you know, most of our families and some of our colleagues think about genetic things as, you know, very simple Mendelian genetics and um, congenital heart disease is one of those things that's much more complicated as we will see. Um, again, I have no disclosures. So let's again start with a case. 72-year-old um, woman, yep, this is congenital clinic. Um, she presents in transfer for possible mitral valve endocarditis to my service. And her past medical history was interesting. At age 35, she'd had a surgical ASD closure, but no other records were available. And she had been admitted with um, sort of typical endocarditis type symptoms, and had, they had seen an abnormal valve on imaging. And when we received her, um, I did a transesophageal echo, and this showed that she had a cleft mitral valve. Um, definitely, I thought this was um, structurally abnormal valve, not a change from endocarditis, with severe regurgitation. There was no evidence of a vegetation, and her blood cultures were negative. So I was not sure that this was mitral valve endocarditis. The change they saw was really, I thought, um, a cleft valve. And she was noted to be an AFib for the first time that had been documented, but we don't really know the chronicity of that. So maybe not too surprising, severe MR, 72 years old, AFib. But her family history was fascinating, and even more fascinating that her daughter worked with me. Uh, and her daughter was like, well, I was diagnosed with an ASD in childhood, had surgery before age five, and she had been overall doing well. The, the patient's son um, had no cardiac diagnosis, but he reported that he had stopped exercising uh, vigorously several years ago because when he would exercise, he would reach a certain point and feel like his heart was really fast and then he might pass out. And it was very uncomfortable for him. So he had become pretty sedentary on his own. No one had advised that. Um, so the, <laughs> the patient um, also had a, a brother with a PS who had had a valvotomy that was required, but no ASD. And then the patient had a twin, a granddaughter and grandson, both of with, with congenital heart disease, who they were the children of this woman. They, one, the daughter had ASD, PS, cleft mitral valve, and the required surgery, and the son, grandson had had an ASD. So pretty interesting family history for this 72-year-old. So she did well at left hospital. We did not think she had endocarditis. She'd had, we thought, a viral URI type symptom. And she went home and unfortunately had sudden cardiac death seven days prior to her next outpatient appointment, um, which was a very upsetting uh, outcome. We brought her son in, the one who didn't want to exercise uh, for an echocardiogram. He had a small PFO, not a true, you know, big secundum ASD, but he had a cleft mitral valve and regurgitation, and when we put him on the treadmill, he did have induced VT. When he got to the level, he said, this is what I feel, this is why I don't exercise. And this daughter had very early closure of her ASD, who was still young, fit, with no other risk factors for AFib, was having proxismal atrial fibrillation on her Holter. So, Interesting, and because of this family history, I actually sent genetic testing, um, and we did a, a commercially available congenital heart disease panel, and the, this family had a GATA4 mutation. Uh, it was associated with a spectrum of congenital heart disease when we looked through the, the databases, uh, ASD, VSD, uh, Tetralogy of Fallot, which might be where the PS came in. And there was, interestingly, with this mutation, a known associated increased risk of AFib, uh, heart block and VT. So um, we did go ahead and do family variant testing. Uh, we were not able to look at our proband who um, died, um, but we were able to look at her son and daughter who uh, I had been able to see clinically. They both were positive. They both had structural heart disease. And then re remember the daughter had the two twins with congenital heart disease. They both had the same GATA4 mutation. Her other son did not. So 
that mattered to this family, even though this was sort of a complex genetic scenario, um, it did help us, I think, um, do more uh, in-depth approach to the son uh, of, the, of the initial patient who we did diagnose with VT and were able to, I think, intervene positively for him. And it does give us some um, markers to look at for these two young children. Uh, with, they may have more high risk of arrhythmia. So congenital heart disease is the most common uh, birth defect. It encompasses about 10% of uh, stillbirths are found to have some sort of congenital anomaly and about 1% of live births, and that's held pretty steady uh, over the years and across different cultures and, and um, areas to live. So right now, adults with congenital heart disease outnumber children with congenital heart disease, so there's about 3,000 adults per million people living. So we've been really battling over the years to just even understand why does congenital heart disease happen? I mean, we know that the embryogenesis of the heart is complex, uh, and it makes sense that we could have these defects. But even back in 1908, I just found this so interesting. Maud Abbott wrote a chapter in Osler's Modern Medicine textbook. Now, at the time, she had no knowledge of Mendel's experiments. So genetics were just sort of kind of starting to come onto the forefront. And she says heredity, although not so clear or constant a factor in cardiac defects as some other anomalies, certainly must bear some part. And that's because she recognized that this congenital heart disease, we were seeing this pretty constant in different populations and blaming the mom for getting a scare or doing eating the wrong thing during pregnancy just didn't seem right, which had previously been the case. Well, we refined that, but even well before really a lot of modern genetic understanding was made, um, 1949, um, John Maurice Hardman, um, he says the causes of CHD are mainly genetic. So he, he went out on a limb. He's the first guy to say that. And he says the genetic is going to be complex. It's not going to be simple. And that makes a lot of sense as we start to understand more and more the complexities of embryogenesis. And then in the 70s, James Nora, a pediatric cardiologist, he uh, postulated that congenital heart disease arises from gene environmental interactions. There may be threshold effects. He thought there might be submicroscopic chromosomal abnormalities. I mean, he recognized that chromosomal aneuploidy wasn't going to be the main driver of most of this because we weren't seeing that in patients when we looked at karyotypes. And then he even thought about some unique genetic mechanisms, mitochondrial imprinting, germline mosaicism, uniparental disomy. So he's really starting to drill down to some really complicated ideas. And these are all just through observations. So from Maud Adams through James Nora, congenital heart disease practitioners have recognized there's congenital, uh, there's genetic uh, interplay, but it's going to be complex. So when we've done more genetic investigation, we're learning more and more, we know now that there are congenital heart disease can be caused by altered level of developmental signaling molecules. So this is unlike the stuff we've been talking about this morning, where we're talking about structural proteins, single gene thing, we mess up fibrillin and you get your aorta gets dilated. Now we're not looking at structural proteins like we've talked about before. We're looking at signaling molecules and molecules that are eventually going to tell genes when to turn on and off. So these mutations are going to affect gene dosage, gene transcription, and they may activate or inactivate a whole developmental pathway. And we'll see some of that as we think about um, how do we get um, problems in sightedness? How do we pick the wrong side? And we know there's a whole signaling mechanism to activate those pathways. So it really is the two sides of, of um, like Janice here. There is such complexity in these developmental pathways that we can see patients who have mutations in different genes completely who had this exact same phenotype or the same malformation. And that tells us that there's interdependent roles of molecules that are involved in cardiac development. So these different pathways may have um, different important roles. And so one change in different parts of that pathway could end up with PS or an ASD. But then we have the other side of the coin. We can have identical gene mutations and get a different 
form of heart disease. And we kind of saw that in our family that we talked about as our case. They all have the same mutation, but they all have slightly different phenotypic expression. And so this tells us that in this complex environment where we're developing the heart, there are very important influences of genomic context, maternal fetal environment, dosage, and such. So when we're thinking more about genetic mechanism of different types of congenital heart disease, we can really think about three large mechanisms. And chromosomal aneuploidy is important. We recognize that with our patients with trisomy 21 and their increased risk of congenital heart disease. And the downstream consequence of that aneuploidy is likely altered dose of specific genes for the development. There are single gene defects, but instead of encoding structural proteins Proteins like we've been talking about, again, these are transcription factors and signal transduction proteins are going to predominate in congenital heart disease. And then copy number variant abnormalities where we get gains or losses in DNA sequences, probably about 10% of congenital heart disease could be attributed to this mechanism. And this, again, just like our chromosomal aneuploidy, probably um, alters the dose of specific genes if we want to think of it in that context. So let's look at a few specific examples. So we already talked about trisomy 21. Of patients with trisomy 21, about 50% are going to have some form of congenital heart disease with AV canal defects predominating, but certainly not the only defect that we see. Uh, so again, this is that side of the coin. We have the same kind of problem, but way different spectrum of phenotype. Turner syndrome, we talked a little bit about in our aortic talk. So about 20% of patients with Turner syndrome of all types, not just pure exo, but all the different mosaic types have congenital heart disease, and we talk a lot about coarctation and bicuspid valve and their increased risk for aortopathy and dissection, but they also have a very high rate of partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. So that's kind of interesting. It doesn't even seem like that's in the same embryologic pathway, but it's present, and we're still trying to understand the genetic mechanism there. And then the trisomies 13 and 18, like Edwards syndrome, they have high, high rates, almost 100% with complex congenital heart disease. How about the point mutations? That's what we're kind of looking for often when we're sending these genetic studies. Um, as we said these are going to alter how car the cardiac development occurs through haploinsufficiency and mostly through reduction in dosage of encoded proteins. So we can inactivate a whole gene if there's a nonsense or a frame shift mutation. Um, you could change a non-coding regulatory protein and then alter the gene expression downstream, so you'll alter um, the, the formation of the heart that way. And then you can get missense mutations that make a loss of function of the protein. We very rarely yet have seen increased gene dosage or increased protein activity um, resulting in congenital heart disease, but we're learning more and more. And then we want to think about, just like in our aortic patients, we have some patients that just have a cardiac defect but no other factors when they might have some of the same targeted protein that patients who have multi-system disease have. And the the distinction there would be like Williams syndrome, um, which is a copy number variant issue, and then a pure elastin mutation. So our elastin mutation patients don't have the Williams syndrome. So here's just an example again of a commercially available a gene panel, and we're looking at a whole host of genes that we can send on our patients. And so we could parse these genes out to these are the transcription factors. So GATA4, like our family that we had, that's a transcription factor. These are really important. And then TBOX5 is interesting, as are the NKX. These are uh, factors that are really important in the development of the conduction system. So we can see a a lot of arrhythmia issues in patients with these transcription factor abnormalities. Um, SMAD6, we've talked about in the SMAD proteins of being so important uh, previously in all kinds of pathways, uh, structural and for congenital heart disease. So this grouping of um, of genes looks at receptors, ligands, signaling proteins, and here we have our all-important NOTCH1. NOTCH1 shows up a lot in a, in a lot of congenital heart disease, and NOTCH1 is really important to move um, 
cells in terms of having them uh, trans, you know, change their cellular type and mature, and it's really important in valvulogenesis. But we see notch one mutations in aortopathy patients and in ASD patients and so forth. So it's really a pleomorphic uh, finding if, if you have that abnormality. So how about these structural proteins? We do have a few structural proteins. I said most are not going to be, but elastin is important, MYH6, ACTC. Um, so these are kind of some of the ASD, Epstein anomaly. Again, the non-syndromic Williams um, can be involved in these structural proteins. So the single gene defect syndromes, meaning I have other, not just my cardiac disease, uh, we wanna think about allergy syndrome, which from the cardiac standpoint could have PS or pulmonary hyperplasia or tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, we have seen defects in JAG1 and NOTCH2 in these patients. Noonan syndrome, a very interesting, recognizable syndrome with a variation in the cardiac abnormalities under associated with that, including PS and HOCOM. Um, and that's a whole host of different single gene defects that have been found in different families with Noonan syndrome. And then Holt Oram, um, congenital or familial ASD with some limb anomalies, um, the T-box 5. We talked about how important T-box 5 is, not only structurally, but for conduction system as well. And they do tend to have increased dose risk of arrhythmias. Um, so those are some of the interesting single gene defects. 22Q11 um, microdeletion syndrome, really important in just clinical practice for patients with congenital heart disease. So this is the most um, common um, congenital heart disease associated with a copy number variant would be associated with 22Q11, about one in 4,000 live births. And if you take all comers of patients with tetralogy of Fallot, about 15% will have this micro deletion that can affect up to 30 genes impacted. But one of the thing, key players we think in this copy number variant is Tbox1 dose is altered. And so that changes cell proliferation in the secondary heart field and can lead to different um, concerns. Uh, Williams syndrome, this is a deletion uh, 7Q11 uh, associated with supervalvular AS and some other factors, um, including developmental delays. Um, these patients have disruption of their elastin gene, but again, there is a point mutation in elastin that can give you non-syndromic supervalvular AS. So, we really still have so much uh, on the horizon to learn and to know about with congenital heart disease, including things like the two HIT hypothesis. Do you have a gene abnormality and then something else happens to you that allows you to express your congenital heart disease? And then really interesting things that alter gene expression that aren't related to specific what we think of as encoding structural or signaling proteins, but what about histone modification and chromatin remodeling? We do think there's something about that that can be important. And these microRNA abnormalities that we're learning more and more about. Now, these last three things are important to us in clinical practice because those of us who see a lot of congenital patients recognize that we all have a significant proportion of identical twins in our practice where there's only one twin with severe congenital heart disease. So we knew right away it's not all just, these are the people who are supposedly genetically identical for the most part. We knew there was something else going on. So I think the twin studies are gonna help us more and more with these um, unusual genetic changes. And so uh, twins are an important uh, uh, substrate to study, but they also have high rates of congenital heart disease. And uh, these are my twin granddaughters. They are identical twins, and so monochorionic twins are identical twins. And remember, there are two types of identical twins. Monochorionic uh, diamniotic, which is by and large the most common. And then the rare momos, which are my little girls, are momos. Um, momo twins have a 57% risk of congenital heart disease. And interestingly, if one twin is affected, in either type of monochorionic twin, only about a 27% chance the other twin's gonna have some form of congenital heart disease. So really illustrating that interplay is not just a single gene defect or a single structural protein. There's all of these things going on. And I'm happy to report that 
my momos don't have any congenital heart disease, but you can imagine that I was the grandparent that wasn't that happy when it was announced that these were uh, mono-mono twins, but we're happy to be on this side of it. And so my current clinical practice, um, we do, I do a genetic panel on my patients who have congenital heart disease who also have a first degree relative with congenital heart disease. I think that helps us advance the science and helps us treat and manage families better. I think all patients with Tetralogy of Fallot and their variants should have 22 Q11 microdeletion testing. That's really helpful for them, especially if they're planning a family, because if you have Tetralogy of Fallot, but no um, 22Q11 uh, microdeletion, your risk of offspring having congenital heart disease is probably on the order of 5% or less. If you have the microdeletion, it's significantly higher, so a 50% chance the kids are going to get that microdeletion, not a 50% chance, thankfully, of tetralogy, but certainly uh, much higher. Um, we should offer fetal echocardiography for all offspring of an affected parent with congenital heart disease, um, whether that's maternal or parental, to help them understand um, risks and, and maybe where we should deliver these babies. Um, and that can be important, and it's important for the families to recognize that their offspring may have more serious or less serious disease than they have if, if they are affected. Uh, we should counsel regarding abnormal risk, even this is a typo, even if genetic testing is normal. Um, and then we should um, screen all first degree relatives of patients with bicuspid valve with an echo. But I'm not genetically testing my bicuspid valves. That's a very uh, homogenous co, I mean, non homogenous cohort. So I don't think right now we have a, a strong indication to send gene testing. So I'm hoping that as we move into the future, we're going to be able to improve predictions or complications in specific patients and family cohorts. So maybe we pick up that you're at higher risk of AFib or other concerns um, with your specific ASD syndrome. Um, maybe as the future evolves, we're going to be able to alter phenotype with molecular intervention. That would be uh, an ideal future state, which I think is quite far away, and then uh, use of other gene therapies to potentially help our patients live healthier and longer lives. Thanks for your attention.